My Achilles hurts when I run out from my house and I go out and back. Sometimes about halfway, I realize that it hurts and I have to limp all the way back. Well, maybe we do a couple small loops. You know, maybe do one mile loops around the house. You're listening to the Restoring Human Movement podcast, where movement experts discuss the latest evidence-based practices to help you and your clients move with mastery. And now, your host, Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez on the podcast mic today, and that was a little tiny clip of the solo podcast I'm doing today on foot and ankle stuff, and I think the, actually the reason why I'm doing this podcast was actually I asked my transcriber who does all the transcriptions for the podcast in case you guys have been on there and read them and so on, uh, she's responsible for it. By the way, if you do need a good transcriber, let me know. Um, she, I was we we're back and forth a little bit on uh, what she wanted to hear on the podcast, and she really enjoys them. And she said she loved the interviews, but at the same time, she liked to hear ones where I did solos. So I'm like, well, I'll do a, I'll do a couple solos in here a little bit for you. Um, and I said, what do you want to hear about? And she said, Achilles injuries, plantar fasciitis, heel spurs. And she does CrossFit, and so she said one guy in her gym actually had surgery where they scraped off the bone on the bottom. So these are... I've actually been writing some things on foot and ankle conditions anyways, so I thought this would be a really good one to add in at this point at session 99. 99? Can you believe we're at 99? Holy crap. I never thought we'd get this far. So if you're having pain in the back of the ankle, having Achilles tendonitis, plantar fasciitis, heel spurs, if you're wondering why your ankle hurts, perhaps you've been told you have Achilles tendonitis or you have calf pain, calf muscle pain maybe, or you've experienced ankle pain after running, this is going to be a great podcast for you. For the clinicians out there, this one will be useful, but it's going to be one that you're going to want to probably share with your patients for them to listen to directly. Now, I'm not going to say you're not going to get any good information from it. Hopefully you will, but I'm going to put this hopefully in a little bit more uh, layman's terms and possibly go into some thought process of, of things that I would probably look at and address if these conditions pop up on people, not just of, of CrossFit, but also uh, running. Um, and I guess so. I guess CrossFit style, I know it's kind of more of a categorization of stuff right now, but um, more high-intensity training, I would say. Or perhaps we can even talk about with Olympic lifting, too, because there's a possibility that these people are actually don't have these injuries to the ankle, and they think they do. They feel like they have referred pain, and... If you listen to the podcast with Dr. Michael Fanning, we kind of went over that. It's it's for IT band stuff, though. If you say you have an IT band issue, but you don't have the mileage to merit the friction syndrome, then maybe it's something else. So as lifters, you might not find IT band issues quite as much. You might not find Achilles issues or plantar fasciitis quite as much, but you could if you merit the distance to it or you had a past injury. Now, uh, if you guys are looking for the show notes, know that you can go into the search function on p2sportscare.com. We will have a podcast tab a little bit more updated very soon. We're going to do actually another website redesign. And I know that some of you healthcare providers out there there have already contacted me about my website. And you're like, how do you make a website like that? Well, it took a a little bit of money. It took a little bit of uh, um, back and forth. And it took a lot of time. It actually took just to do the design portion took about a year, but the content, I mean, there's literally 250 pages behind that main page, so there's a lot of content behind it. So um, we might be increase, uh, changing a little bit to increase user experience. So at this point in time, when you see the search function on there, go ahead and type up your type of condition, and you might be uh, suggested a podcast, an article, or a video. And if you're looking for this podcast in there, it's going to be foot ankle uh, podcast, something of that nature. So it's going to be 99. Uh, Now, let me tell you a little bit about uh, my recent ankle injury that um, I never, ever, ever thought I would get it from what I got it from. It was from brewing beer. So actually, this was not an overuse condition, but it was... It was interesting to see how long this thing lasted. I was picking up, if you guys have ever brewed beer before, uh, we've done quite a few batches before, and you kind of want it when it's cooler. You don't want it when it's like 90 degrees outside because it won't let it ferment quite as well. So 
we had some ingredients. We had a weekend free. We were brewing some beer. And then lo and behold, next day it was like 95 here. Like just a rare like hot streak. So we usually put it out in the garage. And it's like, well, it's not very insulated out there. It can kind of get what the ambient temperature is. So it's it ferments in this glass five-gallon water bottle called the Carboy. And the Carboy has always been... Uh, I've always been kind of leery about it because it's heavy. I mean, you got like five pounds full of liquid in there. It's probably roughly about 50 pounds. No, probably more because it's glass. Those plastic ones are, I believe, about 48 pounds uh, with, with just water in it. So um, this at this point in time, since it was so hot, I thought maybe we should insulate the area. You know, we put it in a cooler. The cooler had some water in it, so at least the water would have... Uh, enough ability to keep it cooler when it was getting like 9,500 degrees outside. So actually before I move, before I before I actually got to this point, I thought a couple times, I should buy something to move this cardboard a little bit more efficiently. And I was like, no, nah, I don't need to do that. And I'm like, but I kept thinking, well, we keep almost dropping it a couple times and that would be kind of bad. And I'm like, no, I'll just get away with it this time, you know. So we put in this water, and uh, another insulating tool we use is sometimes this old wetsuit I have. So I was slipping into this wetsuit, and it was there was water on it from the water in the cooler, and literally about no more than six inches from the ground, and it slipped out of one hand, and it hit the ground and just shattered. And wa- the wa- the liquid pushed all this glass. One of them sliced my ankle right around. Uh, where all the tendons go behind the uh, bump on the inside of the bone called the medial malleoli. So basically all the flexor groups, all the muscles that go to the toes, all the ones that go to the through the big toe, the little toe, the ones that support the arch, um, they didn't get damaged, but they actually, you could see them under the flap of skin that had already kind of come up. So I had to get stitches there, but as a result of some of the swelling from the stitches, like I literally could not walk on this thing for about a month. I was on crutches for easily two weeks. Just to step down on my foot felt like it was going to explode. So it's funny to see the types of things that happen when you can't use your ankle because uh, my other hip and some of my back started to hurt. Using the crutches, uh, my shoulder started to give me a little bit more grief than normal because it was just an increased volume of what I was having to do. So if you can't use the end of that leg, the ankle or foot, then it's 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 a bad deal. So I rehabbed that thing actually pretty well after that, and um, that was not the the result of doing this. Or it it was what well, was months and months ago. But either way, I can I can run now again. I can sl- push a sled again. I can jump rope again. But it was it was actually to this day when someone says or someone gives me something in glass versus a bottle, I'm like, dude, we should, I don't, I don't believe glass is safe anymore. Like we should not be having this glass. Um, and they're like, well, don't worry about it. It's just glass. I'm like, dude, do you have any idea that little thing, what that thing could do to you? Glass is dangerous. It's the devil. So glass is the devil. Okay. So without any further ado, we're going to go into, um, a bunch of topics in rehab as well as theory around plantar fasciitis, Achilles injuries, Heels, spurs, pain in the back of the ankle, Achilles tendonitis, uh, muscle strain of the calf, and much, much more. So you're going to get a ton from this. Here we go. I think I got to take a big breath before this one. Get my sympathetic nervous system down. This is going to be a hard one, honestly. Um, Solo podcasts are kind of tough, but here's how I plan on going through this here today is so there's three different ways I like to describe uh, how to deal with foot ankle issues for patients. Um, and I think this is helpful for, for providers as well if they need a little bit of a, of assistance for game plan. Number one, there's a three-step game plan I like to do. And this is usually a piece of paper I give patients on day one and because there's a lot of information, a lot of testing, a lot of things going on. And they're like, well, what do I do? How do I put these things together? So that's how I kind of use that part. I will go over that in a second. Uh, then I have made an acronym, which I don't know if I'm going to keep it 100%, but it seems to work okay for now. So I call it MAP, M-A-P. Uh, MAP is Modify Pain. It's uh, Activate the Support System and then Pattern, and then eventually get to Load. So MAP your Load. And then there's a higher hierarchy of movement that I, how I describe to people, to people, they're like, well, I don't know what to do with the progression of things. I don't know when I can run. I don't know when I can lift. I don't know when I can do this. 
So hierarchy of, hierarchy of movement is where I kind of go into that, and I'm like, well, where are you at? And they can answer that very clearly, and then they can be able to have a little bit more autonomy to figure out what they can and can't do. Now, into this podcast, I'm going to do a little bit of, um, I'm going to reread here some of the stuff that my transcriber uh, sent to me because she had that question about foot, ankle, Achilles, heel, spurs, and so on. Um, I'm going to answer a couple of these first just because uh, I I love the work that she does and I want to make sure that I'm giving back. And um, I'll probably forget. So if I don't do it right now, I'll probably forget. So let me just read a little bit here for you. So I'm going to summarize some things that she said. So she is was asking about Achilles injuries, plantar fasciitis, heel spurs, um, and uh, surgeries and so on. And she said, I'm always expecting to heal quickly but she gets back to about 90-95% of the way better, and then it's um, such a long healing process that she's afraid of re-injuring it. Um, so she basically stopped doing things like running, box jumps, jump rope, uh, and she does CrossFit, so she's uh, pushing the prowler too, and there's sprint days. So um, I, I totally understand. There is a long healing process for a lot of different types of conditions. Achilles issues definitely take a little bit of time. Foot conditions, plantar fasciitis take a little bit of time, and when I first did some reading through to see what the public was thinking about plantar fasciitis, um, that one in particular, uh, I went through some forums where runners were talking about it, and it sounded depressing. I mean, it was just, um, you know, I've been dealing with this for two years. No one can help me. I tried orthotics. It didn't work. I stopped running. What do I do? I get it. Um, it's very frustrating, and coming out of the injury from that, it's it's very... Um, I'd be hesitant to run as well, which is not always a good thing, but I understand the psychology of that it takes, um, you don't want to be back to what it was because you are afraid of not basically functioning ever again. So I totally get that, but usually when we get the area that is, if it's not a surgical case, if we get the area to desensitize some, um, then we can build a support system around it and movement stops being compensated. And a lot of times then we're off to the races. Uh, metaphorically and probably physically too. Uh, And this goes for CrossFit or uh, lifting, Olympic lifting as well. If you have a foot issue, um, Achilles issue, plantar fascia issue, pain on the inside or outside part of the foot, um, it's the same thing. It's a very simple process. Um, It's desensitized, then you stabilize, and then um, uh, then we we address the pain triggering uh, activities. And I'll go into that more in a second. Uh, the last question she had was two questions, actually. Number one is, what do I think about taping up ankles or feet? Um, honestly, I think it depends on depends on what we're trying to do. And I remember going to a, this was, uh, it wasn't a CrossFit Open. It was, it was something, I think it was MP, MPGL or Grid League or something like that. So anyways, people were getting taped and they're like, they, they came in and they're like, hey, I want to get some tape on that, you know? And I'm like, why? And uh, they're like, well, it just, that's that's what I want. That's what makes me feel better. I'm like, how long have you been using this tape? And they said, well, I've been using it for months. And with situations like that, like with um, with like a plantar fascia issue, I wouldn't be taping it. You know, like I I wouldn't be taping it mainly because I don't want the tape to be the support system that allows you to do the things that are triggering the condition. I'd rather you feel a little bit of pain and be able to realize, hey, we can desensitize that by decreasing or modifying this activity. Um, but if you have to go out and use it that day, like if one of those people came through and they're like, well, I want some tape. This is a brand new thing today. I just want to be able to get through this and I'll deal with it responsibly. By all means, I'm down with that. But so when people are chronically using these things as crutches, I don't think it's helpful at all. Um, she had a question about cushioning, cushioning wraps or padding for the bottom of the foot at the heel. Um, I had on uh, Dr. Thomas Mashad, and we talked about this a little bit. Um, orthotics, he's been in the orthotic industry a lot, uh, a long, a long time. I think it's a family business for him. Um, and he put it a really good way. He said that uh, orthotics are really just intended to, um, what they really do is they disperse load. So if there's uh, focal pain on the bottom of the heel, um, and even whether you believe it's for a, from a bone spur or a calcaneal fat pad or whatever, it just disperses the load and lets it, lets it repair itself a little bit. Um, he said, if you pronate with 
uh, without orthotics and you're going to pronate with orthotics. And it doesn't really change your contact points quite that much. Um, so it's not really a big issue. Um, I can support, I, I can, I, if you're, if you're interested in all the research on that, uh, human locomotion is the book that he put out that is, it's, it's really intensive. And if you're a patient, I wouldn't read it. Um, I would read it if you're a clinician, it's really complicated if you're a patient. And even I had to put it down quite a few times and just take a deep breath. And I even told him, I was like, dude, you should write in a book that is like consumer based. It'd be great. Um, he wasn't doing it yet, so that's the reason why I'm pre- I'm making this uh, manual because I I hear enough people out there who are having foot ankle conditions that just are not uh, getting better. And a book like his is amazing, but it's not digested in a way that consumers can kind of use. So um, this one is written in a way that consumers and athletes can get a little bit hand- handle more of a handle on the thing. Um, now the last question she had was uh, bone spurs. Are bone spurs the cause of pain with Achilles issues and plantar fascia, uh, plantar fasciitis? And it could be, but in my experience, most of the time not. Um, in multiple t- different types of joints with the back, with degenerated, gen- degeneration conditions or osteoarthritis or old age arthritis or any of this stuff, it's um, a lot of times it's not, in my opinion, because I've seen enough people who have had it on their imaging and they're not in pain. And I've seen people who are in pain don't have it. So I think just because something's there doesn't mean it's the cause. And just because you can see it on an image doesn't mean it's in co- a cause. So bone spurs, I'd be very cautious with that. Um, don't jump too quickly on the thought that the spur is the cause of your condition. Um, and lastly, this is her last question. She got a lot of questions, as you can tell. Uh, Ronnie, I appreciate um, I appreciate the questions. Actually, these are great. So she said uh, her husband went into talk to her about an talk to an Eva uh, a uh, a surgeon or a pod, a podi, pod, pod, podiatrist surgeon um, about her condition, and he said, "Well, if you could bring in here, I might do some whittling away or do some surgery on the condi- uh, on the area." Or she can just save herself some grief and do these exercises five times a day, two minutes a day, or two minutes at a time for one to two weeks, and her symptoms will probably decrease or lessen. Um, and so she said she did those exercises and they hurt really bad. And so just my response to this was I really like I liked that the the surgeon was uh, giving some corrective exercises because a lot of times in my experience, and this is the reason why I'm writing this book and doing this podcast, is that. People can get better with corrective exercise. They can get better with some desensitizing types of um, activities and modifying what they're doing, uh, not forever, but for a little bit of time until we get that area to repair. Um, but here's the thing is that I don't, I mean, I usually when I have someone in my clinic and we're like testing something out, like, hey, let's try a wall wedge, let's try a forward lean, let's try a squat. How does this feel on your foot? Oh, it makes it worse. So usually what we'll do is we'll do a slight modification. Let's just say if it hurt in the Achilles area with a squat, I would I would tell them to load into their toes partially or rock into their toes. How'd that feel? Well, it feels better. Good. So their, their exercise or the corrective exercise in that regard would not be to do painful squats. It would be to get every squat to be pain-free. So we're trying to build a movement pattern right here or to uh, rebuild a pathway. And to do it painfully every single time is, uh, is not productive. And um, this is kind of the, the, the one issue where people will ask, what is the best exercise for plantar fasciitis? What is the best exercise for per- perineal tendonitis? What's the best, best exercise for a past ankle sprain? We don't know. I mean, it's very dependent upon the person, but also too, you have to do it right. So um, I think there's a lot of understanding that needs to happen on the person's part, on the patient's part, um, and just do some due diligence and be be willing to test, be willing to A-B test. Does this feel better or does that feel better? Okay, so just because that hurts, maybe I should do it this way. And um, what we find is that we, as we start to load the foot, ankle, and um, that whole complex properly, we see calf strains or t- calf tightness start to decrease. We see loading of the Achilles tendon to start to decrease. We see the plantar fascia start to um, chill out a little bit. Um, and a lot of times it's just foot loading, but it can be a lot of other things too. So 
Um, as I go into some systems right here that I that I've created, the I've kind of alluded to some of them. Um, the number one thing, and this goes along the lines of a lot of different conditions that I see, and uh, I I got this idea from reading uh, Dr. Stuart McGill's Back Mechanic as well as his Low Back Disorders book. Um, he kind of deals with the spine and the disc in, is in the same way, and started realizing that all of these. Uh, conditions can be dealt with this exact same way if they're going to respond. And the first thing we got to do is decrease the amount of sensitizing triggers or activities. Second thing that we have to do is that if you do happen to sensitize it, what do you have to do? What can you do right now to make it decrease? Because we want it to decrease as quick as it came so that we can desensitize the entire system because it's very exhausting to have... um, to have pain and you think about it and you fixate on it. And so actually right now, as I'm doing this podcast, for some reason, I got this pimple on my face. I haven't had one in this spot for a long time, but it feels like it's, I mean, it feels like it's just hot. It feels like it's uh, like kind of pulsating there, how those ones do. It feels like they're, it's ready to go. So I'm thinking about it, you know, and uh, so it's just sensitive. And so if we can get it down, the sensitivity down, uh, ideally, by, by a movement correction or some type of uh, passive care, then I think we're on the right track. Uh, the third is that once we got the triggers down, we got the, the sensitivity down, now we can lay in more of a support system. And this is way uh, where we get the other spots of the body to assist with the ankle. We find that there's um, a correlation with hip and torso with it. We find that the um, that the foot overall can uh, the structures of the foot or the or the uh, the toes can be a big correlating factor to the other types of injuries of the foot and ankle. Um, there's a lot of things that we need to consider. And as I alluded to earlier, or as I talked about earlier, was that sometimes improving loading the foot can desensitize someone immediately as well. So the crossover here, which I haven't made the clear division yet to people is that the desensitizing things, the things you can do to get it to feel better, is sometimes building the support system. So those ones kind of blend a little bit. So let me go into those three again right now. So let's just, uh, I, th- I thought the best way to kind of go through this would be to talk about uh, a different type of foot, ankle, calf strain in correlation to uh, these systems that I'm laying out here. Um, so in this regard, we're going to talk about the Achilles tendon or Achilles tendonitis or Achilles tendinosis. So let's think about all the things that are irritating to uh, Ronnie here. She put on to her thing. So she said, uh, pushing the prowler, sprinting, uh, running, jumping boxes, jump rope. Um, So what I'm hearing is a lot of landing um, and higher than body weight landing. So there's a possibility that we need to modify those a little bit. And there's there's a mental and... um, there's a, there's a mental thing sometimes people have with, uh, or barriers to success with these uh, reducing their sensitivity triggers. And the first thing is, um, and I'm hearing that she's in a group class, so a lot of times the competitiveness of the group class doesn't make it easy to modify. And um, modification of these activities doesn't have to be forever. It just has to be for a period of time so we let the Mother Nature do her thing to repair the Achilles tendon. So perhaps running, we might make a correction, and she can probably row. Um, box jumps, perhaps we do step ups and step downs. Um, jump rope, uh, this might be a little bit tougher, uh, but maybe just going up onto her toes a little bit, up and down, up and down. Um, and pushing the prowler, uh, I I usually find that people that they are pushing them tend to go very quickly with it, and they're not very mindful of their positions and postures with it, so... When I rehab people with, with Achilles tendonitis, a lot of times I'll put them onto a sled, I'll load it really lightly, and I'll say, push it so slow that you have a glass of wine on your back and it's not spilling on my white carpet. So they got to go super slow and they have to keep their pressure and they can't deviate um, from having central stabilization. So a lot of times that decreases their pain um, and they're surprised most of the time. They're like, wow, that felt a lot better. And um, there's, they're thinking it's going to be painful. And I actually was just with a with a friend uh, a couple of months ago, uh, Dr. Richard Hansen, and we were talking about. Uh, I think he wrote an article on. Uh, I think it was a metatarsalgia or Morton's or uh, Morton's neuroma. I forget which, but he sees a lot of uh, track athletes up in Boulder, and we're driving in the car, and he's like, "I get so much traffic on this one page 
um, it's it's uh, it's surprising that there's that many people reading it. And I'm like, well, there's a lot of people with that problem. I'm like, why can't we just push them on a sled and call it a day? And he's like, yeah, you you know, you're <laughs> kind of right. So we start loading in the, into the toes. A lot of times, we we solve a lot of issues. Um, so back to the thing. Anyways, desensitizing triggers a couple mental thing, um, a mental thing that can be a hang up for for people to remedy this is in the running community they will say well i have a saturday run or a sunday run with a group and we go out and i like to hang with these people these are my running partners and i have to stick with them i don't want to lose them what's the point in going i'm like well that's a great point so if you're doing an out and back maybe they're going to go uh, 10 miles out 10 miles back we don't know perhaps you run out five and you walk like two or three or whatever it takes for them to turn around and then you turn around, you meet them back at the five mile mark again, and you run back with them. So you still get the camaraderie of going on a run with them. You can still eat breakfast with them um, and hang out with them after, but you, you're not damaging yourself for the sake of just having camaraderie. Um, also, too, um, if you're running alone, you might say, well, my Achilles hurts when I run out from my house and I go out and back and I come back half, sometimes about halfway i realize that it hurts and i have to limp all the way back well maybe we do a couple small loops you know maybe do one mile loops around the house you know there's that way if you get into trouble there's not that far you have to go to really uh get back get back and, and do some desensitizing things so there's a lot of things to consider with this um just because your running group goes where uh runs on concrete doesn't mean you have to um, so I've, I've met people even that have added in some trail work have been much better. So there's, there's a lot of things to consider. Um, now with the one thing to think about too, with desensitizing, uh, activities is that if you are a lifter such as her, um, we have to consider the possibility that if you don't have the volume of eccentric or lengthening contraction for the Achilles um, to become irritated, then there's a possibility that actually the Achilles is not an issue of the Achilles. And I had a girl come in just the other day that we we just uh, we basically did a, a little bit of a test of what we call dermal traction, and uh, so I lifted the skin around the area of the Achilles, um, kind of where the nerves are going that come from a different area. And it took her pain away. And I had her run, and the pain was gone, and we left the suction cup on there. And um, she's like, well, why is that working? And I said, well, we, we got to look a little higher. So um, a while ago, I did a podcast with Dr. Justin Dean. We talked about uh, basically false or, or pseudo plantar fasciitis. And he said that you'd be surprised how many people come in with thinking they have arch pain or plantar fascia pain, but it's actually a neurological pressure you're pressuring a nerve and it's creating pain in that region so they think it's that because that's all i read about so in that regard if it that does improve it um, we have to figure out if there is there postural changes or loads of the spine which can be affecting it because the nerves of the sp- that come out of the spine if they're sensitized the entire track of the nerve can be sensitized as well so in this case it might present as achilles pain or plantar fascia pain or foot pain in general Next, we get into the second part, which is our things that desensitize. And um, just to reiterate, the first thing is things that you do which create pain, but then after after the pain starts, how do you get it to go away rather than just limp around all day? And um, this is a little bit of trial and error, and it really comes down to uh, a, a good examination or just taking shots in the dark. And I've noticed that some people, just like what I mentioned with that last girl, was that she found that dermal traction and lifting the skin around the area of the Achilles took her pain away, uh, um, took her pain away really, really well. Um, it was about halfway gone. So later in that exam, we, uh, I found that I needed to improve her frontal plane uh, uh, stabilization in her torso and in her hip. So we did uh, side bridges. And I had to run around after that about five reps of both, and we found that her pain was completely gone. And so in that regard, she could do uh, la- uh, lateral wedges or side bridges when her pain gets worse. She can possibly do things like um, uh, increase of intra-abdominal pressure or 
We say sipping soup. Dr. McGill says sipping soup like the air is soupy, like you're in Florida and it's just wet. So <laughs> something like that. And then holding the pressure inside the abdominal area seems to stabilize the torso, which then improves the area of the nerve root as it's coming out, which then decreases the amount of irritation to the Achilles if that was the problem. In other cases, if the problem is toe loading, let's just say, which is another common one that uh, Dr. Masha goes over a bunch, is that if we load into the toes and we found that like a valet forward lean would improve it, then just do 10 reps of that. It's not exhausting at all. You just kind of load into the toes and all the way, boom, it feels better. Miraculous, right? So these things are so uh, low loads that you can do them a lot in the day. And I like to have people desensitize the area before it becomes sensitized. So they just take about, you know, 10, 12 times during the day, start desensitizing it before it gets like that. And then all of a sudden our system is uh, prepped for a stabilization uh, project to be uh, improving. So the last part is building the stabilization system. And this one is, I do have a lot of people who, who ask like, well, how do all these exercises fall into play? Where are we, what are we working out here? What am I supposed to be feeling? What are, what are we doing? Um, and the easiest way to describe it is the body is one unit. We can't separate systems and we can try, we can do like ankle raises and toe raises and things like that. But it really, um, even then you have to have a little bit of uh, hip engagement and leg engagement and torso engagement to do it. But to do it well, to link all the systems together, we need to rehab them together. And um, I had a I had a patient that came in recently. He's a he's a mathematician. He's an interesting guy. And uh, we were talking about how to educate students on math. And he said, "Well, people come in and they uh, like there was a, I forget what the type of math. Let's just say it was stat." And uh, he said, "So they were really bad at this one type. There were about this one type of stat. But all it is is basically." Um, a little bit of trig and algebra within it, and they're really good at those two things. They just they they did really poorly at the overall stat problem. And uh, he said, "I said, well, how'd you fix that?" And he's like, "Well, um, I brought their attention to the fact that there was uh, algebra as well as trig in there, and then they got it all better." Um, so framing it and just realizing this is part of a big picture. So just because you're doing side bridges or wall wedges or valet forward lean. Um, it, it doesn't mean those are going to be part of your rehab forever. You you build a whole process. And the Valet for Lean, if you look at it, we're basically just moving like a plank of wood. And it's very similar to um, pushing a sled. And I know patients, have, they think I'm joking with this, but I, I when it's, when they're ready for it, I tell them to, to take their smallest car they own, put the e-brake on lightly, very lightly, and push it across a, a flat street down their neighborhood. And they're like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm like, yeah, well, you're you're paying to come here to push a sled. The car is going to get some momentum, so it won't be super hard. Just drive through the toes, lean in, plank into it, and push. You know, so it's uh, that that works a lot of things. And if we're going to say it, it works in overhead press, an isometric overhead press, or a forward overhead press, um, it develops torso stiffness. It does uh, basically. It's a plank. Uh, it does breathing work. It teaches you how to sip air. It teaches you how to drive off of one leg. Um, it teaches you how to, to load into the toes. I mean, there's a lot of different parts, and we can take 13 different exercises to make that one car push, but pushing a car might be one of the easiest, quickest, most efficient things that people could do. Um, or even going to a Home Depot and getting a, a wheelbarrow and cutting the legs off it. I mean, you can push it across the lawn or pull it across the lawn. Those are all options for people. But building the support system is... Um, it doesn't have to be super complicated, but in the beginning when we're working on decreasing the amount of pain in the Achilles area with this, then we have to uh, consider what the person can tolerate at the time. Um, I do have more on this in that book, by the way. So if you guys are interested in the book, by the way, I don't mean to keep pitching it, but this is a, this is a, these are comments that, that uh, these are questions that come up a lot. So I'm realizing that I can help a lot of people with this. Um, I, I've taken phone calls. I took one a couple days ago where a lady was talking about, she was from Seattle and she was talking about, um, some of the problems she was having. And I was, I was like, look, I, you're in Seattle. I'm in Huntington Beach. I can't help you. You know, like I can refer you to someone who might practice the same way, but I, I can't help you. And so we talked for a bit and I never really told her about what I, what I thought her problem could be because I, I can't do it over the phone. I got to examine her. 
But it was still a 10-minute phone call, and I was glad to help, but I can't take those phone calls all the time. So I figured by writing these books would be most helpful to people. So um, although... Um, so I don't want to I don't want to be bashful about having you guys go and look at it. Even clinicians will get something from this. So um, it's about fifty pages long, and there's going to be I think close to fifteen videos and maybe twenty videos on some of the stuff that I'm referencing. Now, um, within that book, uh, I talked about this is one of the first books that I that I made where I talked about mapping your load. So MAP. So this kind of falls from that three step process. If you can just think about map, modify pain, activate support, and then pattern, and what this basically goes through is number one, that if, if something hurts, let's reduce the pain, but it doesn't mean we stop there. And this is where a lot of people tend to get into trouble. They're like, well, uh, sorry. in in this, in this, uh, framework, I'm going to talk about plantar fasciitis. So I'll skip gears a little bit here. So if your plantar fascia hurts, the bottom of your foot hurts, we need to figure out what can make it decrease pain within the shortest amount of time. And this is where we go into, you know, passive care. If, if it works, if it doesn't work, don't keep trying. But just because it does work doesn't mean it stops there. You need to activate the support system and then pattern a movement and then possibly load it. So map your load. Now, the plantar fascia, some things that might work is number one, we talked about um, the possibility that it's neurological. So maybe we do some dermal traction. Maybe we do some toe loading. Maybe we do some ice, maybe some heat, maybe some adjustments will work. Maybe injections work. I don't know. Um, by the way, passive care, the, the categorization for this is is things that do not take you really much effort to do um, or someone does to you. So massage would be in there as well. I guess surgery would be a passive care because you don't really do anything. You're asleep. Um, so all these things are there. I don't want you to think that I, I'm hating on them. They're just par- a small part of the puzzle. And you find getting someone to the point where they can modify their own pain is really, really important, and it's super empowering for the person. Um, but then after that, a lot of times people will forget about their pain because their pain is gone. So I would suggest doing that, pos- that, that passive or active pain modifier and then activate the support system around it so we're locking that thing in. Patterning a movement is... Um, so if we're talking about plantar fasciitis, say it hurts to um, walk upstairs. Well, now that we know how to load into the toes, then we might walk a handful of stairs. And before it becomes painful, we stop. So if you know it takes about 30 steps to become painful, then maybe we do 29. And we do this a handful of times throughout the day. So we're building a pattern of movement. Um, adding load would then maybe doing it with a backpack over your over your back or um, something of that nature. So um, I forget who made the actual quote, but I thought it was a good one. It's uh, They say that load uh, tells the body to hit the save button. And once we've modified pain and built the, support, built the endurance of the support system and then pattern of movement doesn't mean that we've hit the save button because the next day we could go back to the same crappy movement, the same pain, the same, uh, well, the support system's still building because it takes a little bit of time to build that volume. But why not hit the save button and then start up on your work the next day? So um, with plantar fasciitis, again, some uh, uh, you, you might find that um, running is painful. Well, maybe we start with a light, maybe we start with a walk. Maybe we'll find that box jumps are painful. Maybe just do uh, five of them only to the point to before you're fatigued. And then you pause and take a little break. So just because the rest of the class is doing it doesn't mean you have to. And just because you're pain-free at five reps doesn't mean you're going to be pain-free at six reps. So we're building we're building a human here. Um, and Rome was not built in a day. And to restore that movement, we have to make sure that we're um, being very mindful of what triggers it, what supports it, what patterns we need to build because those movements have been painful and we can then we can load it. Now, into the next part, um, this is something I actually got from, I think I got it from mainly Exos, but I've modified it quite a bit. Um, the, I call it the hierarchy of human movement. And this is something I've written on the board many times. And I have this in this huge article that I wrote um, because I want people to understand what, what I'm asking of them before they can move to the next step. Because they'll ask, when can I run? When can I do this? When can I do that? In this one, I'll talk about uh, peroneal tendinitis as like a central reference point. So the four points that we need to consider are number one is if you, or actually first is if you can't do one thing, 
in this. If you can't do number one, you can't do two. If you can't do two, you can't do three. If you can't do three, you can't do four. If you can't do one, you can't do four. So if you can't do anything below the one, uh, or the, or if you can't do the precursor, precursor step, then you can't do the other one. So um, if you do, there's just a high high reward, low risk, or high re- high risk, low reward possibility for you. Uh, and I think this is where people who say have perineal tendonitis they they start to go running and running quickly for a long period of time, or they'll do high intensity movements or uh, um, hits training, and then they realize that oh, I'm having pain. Well, you chose to take step four before step one. So step one is. Can you hold position and pressure? Okay, let me say that again. Position and pressure. So if we're attempting to get the foot to be pain-free due to perineal tendonitis, then possibly um, uh, rotation of the foot or on the stance leg, let's say the right foot hurts on the outer part of the foot. Um, Let's say uh, twisting over that foot is a little painful uh, or changing directions. Well, maybe we just find a certain position there, and then we build pressure. And the pressure is in reference to uh, intra-abdominal pressure or central stabilization. Uh, We have this concept of, uh, if you Google this term, um, uh, proximal stabilization for for distal mobility. It basically means that uh, you only move as well as your stable part from the center. So, and I've I've played this game with quite a few people. I have, have them sit on the table and lift their feet up off the ground. And I say, push me with your left hand. Um, do it with your feet on the ground first, actually. And I say, push me with all your might. So they push me. And then after that, I tell them to try to do it. Put your other hand on the belly. Keep your feet on the ground. And I want you to do it without activating any part of your torso. And so they can't do it. And I said, uh, well, let's recap on that. So your torso has to work for you to push me. So the torso has a correlation with the shoulder and the hand and the wrist and the elbow. And the same thing happens with the lower extremity too, is that if we are not keeping pressure and position of the torso, then we keep, can't keep position of the foot to be in a pain-free position, all right? So in general terms, I say, if you can't hold position, then you don't deserve to move. Because step two is moving, movement or pattern. So if you're going through a movement and it starts to hurt, but it didn't hurt as we were doing static holds or non-movement holds, um, then there's a possibility that you're having a transitional problem. We see this a lot with people who uh, have lower back pain. They wake up and their back feels amazing. And as soon as they roll out of their bed and stand up, their back hurts. So the problem was not the position of laying in bed. The problem was not standing up or standing the problem was how they got from one position to another. So movement is similar to that in this in this step two. We need to make sure the path has the correct pressure and position behind it. Third is load. So I wouldn't move anything heavy if you couldn't do it with your own body weight, right? That's pretty simple. Fourth is doing it quickly. I wouldn't move quickly if I couldn't move slowly. So... If we bring this back to perineal tendonitis, a lot of people have this when they run. So if you have it with walking or have it with standing, why would we go jogging, right? So just consider that how many times, if you can't stand on one leg without having pain, then how do you expect to stand on one leg and push off of it while under exhaustion 7,000 times in a run? It's ridiculous, right? Um, and I don't have a problem with running at all. I don't have a problem with plyometrics. It's just that are we prepared for it? Um, and I interviewed, uh, uh, Michael Ban recently and he, he brought up a lot of these points and he said, it's just, um, he doesn't, he didn't have a problem with, or it's coach Michael Band, uh, Ban double N. So he didn't have a problem with this either. It's just, it's just, are you, is your body have the proper support systems for it? Um, how we condition the person or the human or the joint to be able to tolerate those loads just because it's body weight and running doesn't mean that it's, it's the least risky thing that you can possibly do. Now, those are the major, um, kind of systems or analogies or frameworks that I typically use. Um, and within the book, I put some other things that I thought would be helpful for everyone to understand as well is that just some general theories of why an ankle hurts, hurts in the first place. 
Number one, uh, I know a lot of people jump to stretching and rest and so on, but there's a possibility that the joint is actually too loose. Let's just speak in a very general term. So number one, is your joint too loose? Number two, is your joint too tight? Uh, And why? Why are these things tight? Um, Number three, your joint is busted. And number four is your joint is not the painful thing at all. So let's just cover these really quickly. So is the joint too loose? Because I know a lot of people jump to stretching with this. It's it's uh, If your joint's too loose, let's just say that um, you haven't had proper support around it. Say you tore a ligament, say you had past damage, you had past ankle sprains. Why are we trying to loosen this anymore? You know, like I understand the feeling of tight, but is, is, is it actually tight? And we have tests that we can do um, in the clinic where we figure out if this ankle or foot is more, more or less... Uh, lax than the other, let's just say, because laxity, I think, is relative, and it could be normal to you, but not normal to somebody else. Um, So I think generalizing and saying that we're going to do some stretches on something, um, why would we loosen if it's already too loose? Perhaps this joint or this foot, ankle, Achilles, um, calf pain might be an issue of not enough stiffness. So in that point, we improve some stiffness around the area um, to to solidify it up. And um, an analogy I've used with this is we've, uh, I, I wish I had this thing in my office, but it's, if you guys ever play Jenga, Jenga's that block game. Um, but Jenga is like, I mean, it's pretty solid. Like if you stack that thing up from the start and if you stood on it, like you would, you'd be fine, right? I'd feel confident going single leg on it. I can drink a cup of coffee while I'm on that single leg. It's all good and fine. But um, it's also really hard at that point if I was standing on it for anyone to push any of the other bricks out because I'm compressing it down. So compression across the the joint actually stabilizes it, uh, which is not a bad thing. Um, People think compression, that's bad. It's not always bad. Um, It's supportive sometimes and and therapeutic. Um, Loosening would, uh, me getting off that Jenga block or Jenga stack would actually make it easier for those things to slide through. So I had a girl recently where she, uh, she felt like every time when she was playing soccer, the plant leg, it felt like the ankle slid. Uh, and I was like, slid off the grass? She's like, no, it just feels like it's loose inside her. Um, she explained it very unique, a unique way. I'm like, so it's not painful. She's like, no, it just feels kind of sloppy. And um, so we did some toe strengthening exercise and it's over the course of a week, and it started to feel better. So in that case, we might not loosen anything because it's already too loose, or at least it feels loose. Um, it didn't really test that loose in testing, but um, we got to go off what the person says too. Now, the second is, is joint too tight? So if it's too tight, why is it tight? What is protecting it? What is what what is being so contracted or so fixated that um, what is it? Number one, and like why is it doing it? Second, um, because we do have the possibility that the tightness of one area is one muscle or tendon overworking to support the jingle block that is not being supported by the other sides. So if you had that jingle block tower, and if I duct taped it on one side, just because that duct tape's tight doesn't mean that. Um, we have complete support. So we might want to have the duct tape around the sec- second side or the, the all four sides or whatever, um, which makes it more supportive as well. So um, there is a possibility, though, that um, if something does need to be loosened, it's, um, it's or sorry, if it's too tight, it could feel tight and pinchy um, within a certain range of motion because you actually are, in fact, pinching something So you can pinch the fat pad in front. You can pinch a bone spur. Um, It can feel tight on the backside when you're you're trying to stretch it because a muscle is too tight. But is it too tight from a neurological aspect? Is the electricity going to that muscle um, of of the calf and telling it to contract to hold on for dear life? Because if it goes too far, it's going to be worse. So a lot of reasons it could be too loose or too tight, but... Generally speaking, if it's too tight, maybe we want to use that MAP type of uh, protocol. We decrease the amount of uh, modify pain or modify sensation, modify how it feels, and then we start to support it, and then we start to pattern it, and does it feel better after that? That's kind of how I take that. Number three is a joint busted, and a lot of people don't think about this. Rips, tears, fractures, um, these are things that they could be, um, they could be trauma or not trauma. Uh, Fractures in the foot metatarsal stress fractures a lot of times associated with the toes not loading because now you load the metatarsal too much rather than disperse the load amongst the toes so in that case um sure there's a fracture but we might treat that a very a certain way by unloading it 
just like um, just like we talked about in the first framework, is that we desensitize the tissue. So in that case, we might not walk on it, we might cast or boot it. Uh, rips and tears, those would usually result in some type of um, swelling or bruising. And that's important to realize because I know a lot of people freak out about like, well, did I tear or rip something? Well, maybe, but uh, at least the general categoriz- categorization is there's a bunch of uh, type 1 tears, but type 2s generally have a little bit of bruising uh, and swelling, and type 3 are complete detachments. So um, in those cases, those type 2 and 3 might treat them a little bit differently. But type 1s are usually, uh, um, I wouldn't consider it in the busted range. I would consider it something else. Um, and number four, is your is your joint pain, is your ankle pain, is your Achilles pain, your plantar fascia pain, or your parent per- peroneal tendonitis, is it from something else and not that tissue at all? Um, so lumbar spine nerve root irritation is one. Uh, lumbar spine disc injury, peripheral nerve entrapments, uh, central nervous system disorders, or uh, I never like to bring this one up, but it could be too. Is it in your head? Um, uh, I'd never tell people that it's in their head. Um, but there's a possibility that, um, I mean, we have people who are hypochondriacs and the brain is extremely powerful uh, and we have those conditions like, um, which I'm not well versed in, but let's say phantom pain syndrome or, fan, or phantom limb syndrome, I think, whereas where you don't have a foot and the foot hurts. So the brain is extremely powerful and we would uh, address those a little bit of a different way. Now, I'm just kind of skimming through this uh, this book that I have just to make sure I'm addressing as much as I possibly can in this podcast um, without, um, I don't want to say not revealing things in the book, because the whole point is to share. Um, but some of them are, can't be really demonstrated on a podcast. But um, for clinicians out there, the things that you might be interested in and also uh, really interested patients might want to want to know this too, is that, so these are, I I wrote down some theories of testing or, or clinical reasoning that I typically go through with um, foot, ankle pain, calf pain, and so on, um, is that I, at first I thought I went into four theories, and I, I kind of make these up on a fly when I start working with people, and I just kind of follow the I follow the path that they present. Um, so if they they show me that it, their, their Achilles hurts or their calf hurts as they bend forward, then I'm chasing uh, one rabbit. I don't really want to chase a bunch of rabbits, so I just kind of figure out which general path we go into, and then I start to address it and see if it bears fruit. Uh, the first theory is that the, the foot or ankle is unhealthy because it's improperly loading. So I have a handful of ways that I would typically test that theory. Um, I mentioned one earlier, the valet forward lean is an amazing one, and so are lateral wedge, crossover wedge, front wedge. Um, and usually, uh, if we cue the person correctly, um, if this is the problem, it'll start to bear fruit and the person will say, wow, my pain's really cut in half. Uh, or um, it's important to realize in the beginning, before you do this, you need to have the person demonstrate what starts to trigger their pain. Perhaps they jog around the office. Perhaps they um, go up on the toes. Perhaps they um, dance. I had a lady that danced the other day and that was that was kind of interesting and fun. So we, we went through the dance process with her and I, I acted as her partner. And uh, so... Uh, I was able to coach her into having a pain-free dance by some of the things that we did through through that movement and testing that theory. So theory two, the foot or ankle is unhealthy because the toe strength is low. And this is one that I picked up from Dr. Thomas Schott again. Um, there is there's quite a few ways to, to test this as well, but um, after speaking with him on the podcast, I realized how how amazingly smart he is and how, how much research he's done. Or um, I saw that he had a product called the Toe Pro, and I'm like, I, I think since we spoke, I think I've sent about four people over, five people over to uh, his website just to buy that. And uh, it's currently, at the time of the podcast, the time I bought it, it's $45, and I think shipping's free. So, And I know people are like, well, do I really have to buy this product? And I'm like, well, no, you don't have to, but I'm like, here's a, uh, I'm like, here's your options. You want Do you want the most efficient way? Do you want the cheapest way? Or do you want the most uh, complicated way? And like, well, I want the best way. Good. Well, you'd be happy to know that actually that the most effective way is actually one of the cheapest ways. And um, I'm like, you can try to make this little the foam device, but it's going to cost you just as much, and it's going to be uh, less. Uh, it's it's going to be subpar, and you're going to realize that you just destroyed something, and you might not have made it. Um, correctly anyways, so you might as well just buy the thing for 45 bucks, super steal. So go on to uh, 
Thomas Shad's website and look up the toe pro. It's pretty pretty legit. Um, the third theory is the foot and ankle is unhealthy because the torso and hip stiffness is unhealthy. And um, after speaking with him about this, he said that usually high level runners or high level athletes have hip their hip and torso is usually okay, but the toe strength is usually something to, to seriously consider. But in a, in, a, in un, unconditioned or um, un uh, high level athletes, then we have to consider the hip and torso a little bit more, um, just because they typically don't have the time to do to the de- do, to do the conditioning and strength work strength work needed to have those healthy in the first place. And I would fall into this category too. I'm definitely not a high level athlete, and I work all week, and I do podcasts and so on, and I don't always have time to strength train or do my work. So um, this is always subject in there. So if you're looking at uh, not professional athletes, but athletic professionals, then, or you are one, then you have to consider this, that, and there's a possibility that the work that you're doing with your trainer or by yourself or with your doc is not the best. So, um, maybe you need to consider the possibility that, um, your work is in the wrong direction and it can just be improved a little bit is all. Now, uh, I did a subgroup on this is theory 3.1 is test anti-rotation as the reason for the unhealthy hip and torso. And I found this a lot with runners, um, anti-rotational drills such as uh, Paloff press um, or torsional buttress are really good ones to use. Um, sometimes we find that the person clears up uh, very quickly, 50%. On this uh, 3.2 theory is uh, test poor hip centration as the unhealthy reason. So just because the torso is strong doesn't mean the hip moves well in the, well in the socket or it's not centrally, centrally located and able to do the rotation that it needs. Because if the hip does not do the rotation and movement and flexion and extension that it needs, it, it, it affects loading process of the foot. And you can test this if you're seated right now, if you're walking, um, kind of move your knee inward and that brings the hip inward. And then it also moves the arch of the foot inward or collapses it. And then we have change of contact, uh, change of ground contact, which then can affect the uh, ankle and foot. Now, um, the last one is is the foot and ankle pain, really uh, referred pain. And I mentioned that earlier, and I think that's really important to understand. I actually did a, um, uh, I did a study that it was not peer-reviewed, or actually it was peer-reviewed, but it wasn't published because the sample size was too small. But the purpose of the study was to see the effectiveness or the accuracy of patient self-diagnosis. And I actually went to a running group on this, and I and I just stood out in a bunch of about 100 runners, and I said, look, I'm doing an ultrasound study on Achilles tendonitis and how well, or if you have it or not. And some guy raised his hand, and he said, what is Achilles tendonitis? And I said, that's a great question. I can't tell you. So I'm like, you can literally point at your shoulder and say, I have Achilles tendonitis, and I will still image your ankle and tell you yes or no. And again, the point is, to see whether people can diagnose something very simple on their own. And here's what we found, and the reason why, again, it wasn't published, um, or it wasn't, I guess, it wasn't considered significant was because my sample size was way too small, which affects uh, and skews the results. But it was very look, it was looking very promising. And I can tell you from an examination standpoint that most people were not right. And I think it was roughly about 45% were wrong, um, or 45% were right, actually. So, I think we only tested 13, 14 people, Um, but they actually, of those people, only 45% were right. And my my reasoning on this, my thought with this is the the Achilles tendon is a very general term. Achilles tendonitis is an extremely common thing that people should be familiar with if they're in a athletic population. And it's you can see it, you can feel it. You should you should be able to get it right, Um, but they didn't. Which leads me to believe that the more complicated conditions, things that you can't actually feel or that you've maybe never heard of before, it's really hard to diagnose that on yourself and get it right. So let's just say a heart attack, you got arm pain. Should you self-diagnose that? Probably not. You know, plantar fasciitis is there's multiple, multiple layers of things in the foot. Should you diagnose it yourself? Probably not. And probably the Achilles, you shouldn't either. Um, and although I wrote this book, I still think people should go in and have a legit test and a legit test or a legit exam of the foot, ankle, and the entire body, it encompasses more than five minutes. 
I cannot stress that enough. If your doc or your PT or your therapist or um, whoever you have, uh, maybe even your medical doctor, is is not really examining it for more than five minutes, it's really hard to tell. Um, yeah, and you, you need to have a better exam. And now I'm not saying that you can't tell a lot just by looking at a person because you can. And I told a guy this over the phone just the other day. He talked about his knee. Um, he was wondering, like, well, what are you going to do in the office? And I said, well... Um, well, what's your concerns? And he's like, well, I had surgery before and I don't know if I'm going to need it again and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I can, I can tell, but just by you looking in the office, whether you're a surgical case or not on your knee. And here's the rationale behind that is because if, you, if you're limping or you're, you're walking like a peg leg, then there's a higher probability you're going to need it because you might have a bucket handle tear. But the, the knee being such a, it's a circuit breaker of the leg we need to look around it anyways. We need to look at the hip. We, look at, we need to look at the foot, the ankle, the torso, the other leg, how you load it. We need to look at all these things. But I can tell you overall that um, if you can walk in, then I'm going to I'm gonna be rehabbing you or at least examining you for a long period of time. And I can do a, a hip exam in about five minutes, but I certainly cannot do a movement exam and dynamic exam. And a low back exam takes me an hour and I could do it quicker if we didn't have Q&A, but really it comes down to patient rapport. So if I was to sit here and just act like you're a, like you're a cow or like you're a, you know, a livestock or something, like I wouldn't have to talk to you or explain anything to you. But if you have questions and concerns and so on, and um, that's our due diligence. That's our, that's our, that's our responsibility. Um, that's our responsibility to you as a patient is to educate you and make you feel calm and make sure that we can um, get to the root of your problem. Um, so that's the number one thing. Testing you takes a little bit longer, and then documenting it takes even longer than that. So um, if you are attempting to diagnose yourself, please go see somebody. Um, you will be super impressed. Um, our fee schedule is is higher than a lot of people's, but I can tell you for whatever you're spending on, and nothing against personal trainers, but I know people that spend like $175 on a personal trainer for an hour. That's great. I love that you're with a trainer, but at the same time, you can probably get a ton of information about your problem and just uh, your trainer's going to be so excited that you you got an examination. And then now they can get to uh, work with you and help you load better and you'll get, you'll, you'll Im- improve how you feel with leaps and bounds. So, it's it's a trade off there, but just realize that um, you can't get it done in five minutes. And anyone who's going in and applying something, applying a treatment or a suggestion um, without looking, then they they could be suggesting the wrong thing, or at least something that's not st- extremely effective. So if you want the most effective thing, you need to be well versed in what your body is doing, how it feels, how it loads, what improves it, what doesn't improve it, and so on. So. Um, that is the conclusion of uh, me talking about foot and ankle stuff. And I really hope that anyone, mm, actually, you know, I don't know if I should conclude that yet because this is one that I'm going to send all my patients that have foot ankle problems. Um, I guess I should uh, include any common questions uh, that I get. So um, number one, can plantar fasciitis get better? Yes, it can. Can Achilles tendonitis get better? Yes, it can. Uh, How long does it take? It depends on the person. It depends on how long. Uh, I would usually say that plantar fascia, I'd give it about, um, you, you're you going to feel less pain in, uh, significantly less pain in well less than a month, um, but you might not be back to your full activity uh, within a month because uh, you you might have been deconditioned and we might, be, we, might, we might be addressing other things, building a support system and you know, improving how you move, patterning it or mapping it. Um, and for, do you need an x-ray? If there's trauma, an x-ray is nice to have. If you're concerned about larger problems in there, such as um, bone uh, bone cancer or tears and rips and so on, x-rays and MRIs are great to have. But also, too, when you're looking at those, don't be freaked out by the terminology, the medical terminology that are used. I can't stress that enough. Um, I've had patients come in with um, uh, foot problems, and they look through there and they're like, holy crap, like I didn't realize there's so much wrong with me. I'm like, well, there's not a lot wrong with you. It's just those are just normal variants for you. They're not painful, but over here is the thing that's creating pain in this location. And now we just, are you feeling better? Yeah, I am. Good. Okay, so let's ignore this stuff. Uh, let me let me tell you when these things are going to be significant. We need to worry about them. But for the most part, I would trade ankles with you any day. And I've seen a lot of people with the 
findings on imaging that you have uh, that are pain-free. So does that address your problem? Does that address your concern? Yeah, it does. Cool. Let's let's get back to what we're doing again. Let's get back to doing your homework. Let's go back to decreasing the amount of sensitizing triggers. Let's get, let's get back to building the support system and realizing that you are in complete control of this thing. Um, I'm here to help. And uh, I think that's all the major questions that I get. Now I'll close out that part of the podcast and we'll go into the outro. Okay, everyone, that was, is the my solo on foot ankle stuff. If you're looking for the show notes on that, it is session 99. By the way, share this with a friend. Share this with a friend who has um, foot ankle Achilles issues that they have been dealing with for years and they just think it's a normal aging process because it's probably not. A lot of them aren't. Some are, some aren't. Anyways, if you're looking for the show notes on this, go onto the website and type up foot ankle. You're going to find probably the show notes for this, the full-length podcast, as well as a great article that I wrote on, uh, this was mainly for runners. This was the six most common uh, reasons for ankle pain while running. Um, On that page, by the way, as well, uh, there's going to be some suggestions for the mini course, which I created some mini courses that are very close to being live. Uh, We have foot, uh, foot ankle. We have knee and we have low back. And um, when they're live, they're going to be promoted on that page. So you might have a fly-in that comes in and says, hey, do you want to do the mini course? Or hey, you want to buy the course? Um, and the reason why I made these things was because I, I do have a fair amount of people. Like I had a friend who, he lives in San Diego and he texts me and he's like, hey, I got this, I got this back problem. What do I do? I'm like, that's, that's a big, that's a big question, man. Like I... I'd love to help right now, but once you come up, and like, well, I don't have any time. And it's like, okay, great. So I can send you someone in there, and they're like, oh, they're in my network, and blah, blah, blah. So there's all these other little hang-ups. I'm like, dude, I, I want to help you. I do really do want to help you, but this is going to take probably more time than I could I could do right now on an individual basis to share videos, share articles, and so on. And literally everything is on the website right now. Literally, it's all there um, or on the YouTube channel. So what I decided to do for these things, though some of the things I get the most commonly uh, asked about is low back, foot, ankle, knee, and I need to do shoulder. Um, so you're going to see the foot, ankle one suggested on there, and it's mainly it's a seven. It's going to be a seven day email course. Uh, I, we don't know if it's going to be free or not yet, but either way, it's going to be a very nominal price. Um, mainly the price is because uh, if we do the price, it's because we're back and forth on the possibility that when people get something for free, they don't do it. And the whole point is not to give someone like something that took me hours to write and just not have them do it. We want them to do it. So I want them to get better. So maybe just a nominal fee on that. Um, but the ebook after is full of a bunch of corrective exercises, full of a bunch of strategies and um, theories that we use with rehabbing foot, ankle, and calf conditions, especially in endurance populations. Um, the main target for that book is, um, and a lot of things I write for, for foot ankle is female recreational runners who have under two years experience who have had aches and pains throughout that career. So when we go through this ebook, which um, I wrote this thing literally with everything I, I know about foot ankle conditions and ones that can create referred pain into foot ankle areas. So there might be a slight tangent in there, but we go into foot ankle anatomy. We go into foot ankle biomechanics. We go into torso hip ground contact and how, how it, what it has to do with that stuff. We go into the theory and clinical reasoning of how to correct, um, provide corrective exercise for unhealthy foot ankle uh, can, uh, people, um, as well as I think at this point we're up to 15 videos of corrective exercises that we use based upon the case. So, um, and actually too in there, uh, I was hesitant to write this, but I said if I had to gamble on the best rehab program, it would be, because the hard thing with this is that Everyone has very different cases, um, but I guess if I had to gamble and someone said they had, you know, plantar fascia pain, I can guess what I think might work, but realistically it could be wrong. I wouldn't bet every dollar I have on it. Um, but when it comes to these these uh, books, and the reason I'm bringing, up, bringing them up is because I really want to make a change in the healthcare profession here, and I want patients to better understand the reasons why they're experiencing their what they're experiencing. And there's a lot of misinformation, old information out there on the internet that I think we can improve on. So these courses are basically designed to take care of that. And if you imagine me hanging out with a doc at a bar and you're behind us and you have a foot ankle condition, you're good friends of both of us. We're not going to just leave you out in the dust and talk about 
uh, things that you don't know and don't understand. We're going to explain them a little bit. So think of it as that. So the, the healthcare providers are going to get something from this. Also, to the patients will get something from this. So it will be written in a way where everyone will understand, and the videos will be uh, comprehensive enough to where the, the cues are really, really good. So you guys can reach that by going to the search fun- function on the site. If there's anything that you guys want to hear about, anyone you want me to interview, any topic you want me to cover, just tell me. Just email me, info at p2sportscare.com. I'm here for um, building education for the public and the profession. And I'm not going to say I know everything because I don't. I spoke with a, with a doc who knows a lot more than me the other day on the phone. Um, but either way, if I can if I can help some people some understand some stuff, then I, uh, uh, I want to do that for them. So uh, as always, be good to each other. And it's not what you take, it's what you leave. Talk to you later. Bye.